Section 1 of Cossack Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Wilkins, June 2017. Cossack Fairy Tales by Robert Nisbet Payne. Introduction. The favourable reception given to my volume of Russian fairy tales has encouraged me to follow it up with a sister volume of stories selected from another Slavonic dialect extraordinarily rich in folk tales. I mean Ruthenian, the language of the Cossacks. Ruthenian is a language intermediate between Russian and Polish, but quite independent of both. Its territory embraces, roughly speaking, the vast plain which lies between the Carpathians, the watershed of the Dnieper, and the Sea of Azov with Lemberg and Kiev, for its chief intellectual centres. Though it had been rigorously repressed by the Russian government, it is still spoken by more than 20 millions of people. It possesses a noble literature, numerous folk songs, not inferior even to those of Serbia, and, what chiefly concerns us now, a copious collection of justly admired folk tales, many of them of great antiquity, which are regarded, both in Russia and Poland, as quite unique of their kind. Mr. Alston, I fancy, was the first to call the attention of the West to these curious stories, though the want of that time of a good Ruthenian dictionary, a want since supplied by the excellent lexicon of Zelikovsky and Nidilsky, prevented him from utilizing them. Another Slavonic scholar, Mr. Morfil, has also frequently alluded to them in terms of enthusiastic but by no means extravagant praise. The three chief collections of Ruthenian folklore are those of Kulish, Rchenko, and Dragomanov, which represent, at least approximately, the three dialects into which Ruthenian is generally divided. It is from these three collections that the present selection has been made. Kulish, who has the merit of priority, was little more than a pioneer, his contribution merely consisting of some dozen Kaski, Merchin, and Kazachiki, Merchin Lane incorporated in the second volume of his Zapiski o Yuznoi Rusi, Descriptions of South Russia, Petrograd, 1856-1857. Twelve years later, Rutchenko published at Kiev what is still, on the whole, the best collection of Ruthenian folk tales, under the title of Narodnoya Yuznoruskiya Skaski, Popular South Russian Folk Tales. Like Linrut among the Finns, Rutchenko took down the greater part of these tales direct from the lips of the people. In a second volume, published in the following year, he added other stories, gleaned from various minor manuscript collections of great rarity. In 1876, the Imperial Russian Geographical Society, published at Kiev, under the title of Maloruskia Narodnia Predonia i Raskazui, Little Russian Popular Traditions and Tales. An edition of as many manuscript collections of Ruthenian folklore, including poems, proverbs, riddles, and rites, as it could lay its hands upon. This collection, though far less rich in variants than Rutchenko's, contained many original tales which had escaped him, and was ably edited by Michael Dragomanov, by whose name, indeed, it is generally known. The present attempt to popularize these Cossack stories is, I believe, the first translation ever made from Ruthenian into English. The selection, though naturally restricted, is fairly representative. Every variety of folk tale has a place in it, and it should never be forgotten that the Ruthenian Kaska, Merchin, owing to favorable circumstances, has managed to preserve far more of the fresh spontaneity and naive simplicity of the primitive folk tale than her more sophisticated sister, the Russian Skaska. It is maintained, moreover, by Slavonic scholars that there are peculiar and original elements in these stories not to be found in the folklore of other European peoples. Such data, for instance, as the magic handkerchiefs, generally beneficial, but sometimes, as it is in the story of Ivan Golik, terribly baleful. The demon expelling hemp and tar whips, and the magic cattle teeming egg so mischievous a possession to the unwary. It may be so, but after all that Mr. Andrew Lang has taught us on the subject, it would be rash for any mere philologist to assert positively 
that there can be anything really new in folklore under the sun. On the other hand, the comparative isolation and primitiveness of the Cossacks and their remoteness from the great theatres of historical events would seem to be favourable conditions both for the safe preservation of old myths and the easy development of new ones. It is for professional students of folklore to study the original documents for themselves. R and B. End of section one. Recording by Adam Wilkins. Section two of Cossack Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Cossack Fairy Tales by Robert Nisbet Bain. Oh, the Tsar of the Forest. The olden times were not like the times we live in. In the olden times, all manner of evil powers walked abroad. Footnote. Div. This ancient, untranslatable word, comparable to the Latin deuce, is probably of Lithuanian origin, and means any malefic power. End of footnote. The world itself was not then as it is now. Now there are no such evil powers among us. I'll tell you a kashka. Footnote. A folk tale. Russian. Shashka. German. Merchen. End footnote. Of O, the Tsar of the Forest, that you may know what manner of being he was. Once upon a time, long, long ago, beyond the times that we can call to mind, ere yet our great-grandfathers or their grandfathers had been born into the world, there lived a poor man and his wife, and they had one only son, who was not as an only son, ought to be to his old father and mother so idle and lazy was that only son that heaven help him he would do nothing he would not even fetch water from the well but lay on the stove all day long and rolled among the warm cinders if they gave him anything to eat he ate it and if they didn't give him anything to eat he did without his father and mother fretted sorely because of him and said what are we to do with thee o son for thou art good for nothing other people's children are a stay and a support to their parents but thou art but a fool and dost consume our bread for naught but it was of no use at all he would do nothing but sit on the stove and play with the cinders so his father and mother grieved over him for many a long day and at last his mother said to the father what is to be done with our son thou dost see that he has grown up and yet is of no use to us and he is so foolish that we can do nothing with him look now if we can send him away let us send him away if we can hire him out let us hire him out perchance other folk may be able to do more with him than we can so his father and mother laid their heads together and sent him to a tailor's to learn tailoring there he remained three days but then he ran away home climbed up on the stove and again began playing with the cinders his father then gave him a sound drubbing and sent him to a cobbler's to learn cobbling but again he ran away home his father gave him another drubbing and sent him to a blacksmith to learn smith's work but there too he did not remain long but ran away home again so what was that poor father to do i'll tell thee what i'll do with thee thou son of a dog said he i'll take thee thou lazy lout into another kingdom there perchance they will be able to teach thee better than they can here and it will be too far for thee to run home so he took him and set out on his journey they went on and on they went a short way and they went a long way and at last they came to a forest so dark that they could see neither earth nor sky they went through this forest 
but in a short time they grew very tired and when they came to a path leading to a clearing full of large tree stumps the father said i am so tired out that i will rest here a little and with that he sat down on a tree stump and cried oh how tired i am he had no sooner said these words than out of the tree stump nobody could say how sprang such a little little old man all so wrinkled and puckered and his beard was quite green and reached right down to his knee what dost thou want of me o man he asked the man was amazed at the strangeness of his coming to light and said to him i did not call thee be gone how canst thou say that when thou didst call me asked the little old man who art thou then asked the father i am o the tsar of the woods replied the old man why didst thou call me i say away with thee i did not call thee said the man what thou didst not call me when thou saidst o i was tired and therefore i said o replied the man whither art thou going asked o the wide world lies before me sighed the man i am taking this sorry blockhead of mine to hire him out to somebody or other perchance other people may be able to knock more sense into him than we can at home but send him whither we will he always comes running home again hire him out to me i'll warrant i'll teach him said o yet i'll only take him on one condition thou shalt come back for him when a year has run and if thou dost know him again thou mayst take him but if thou dost not know him again he shall serve another year with me good cried the man so they shook hands upon it had a good drink to clinch the bargain and the man went back to his own home while o took the son away with him o took the son away with him and they passed into the other world the world beneath the earth and came to a green hut woven out of rushes and in this hut everything was green the walls were green and the benches were green and o's wife was green and his children were green in fact everything there was green and o had water nixies for serving maids and they were all as green as rue sit down now said o to his new laborer and have a bit of something to eat the nixies then brought him some food and that also was green and he ate of it and now said o take my laborer into the courtyard that he may chop wood and draw water so they took him into the courtyard but instead of chopping any wood he lay down and went to sleep o came out to see how he was getting on and there he lay a snoring then o seized him and bade them bring wood and tie his laborer fast to the wood and set the wood on fire till the laborer was burnt to ashes then o took the ashes and scattered them to the four winds but a single piece of burnt coal fell from out of the ashes and this coal he sprinkled with living water whereupon the laborer immediately stood there alive again and somewhat handsomer and stronger than before o again bade him chop wood but again he went to sleep then o again tied him to the wood and burnt him and scattered the ashes to the four winds and sprinkled the remnant of the coal with living water and instead of the loudest clown there stood there such a handsome and stalwart cossack footnote kajak a cossack being the ideal human hero of the ruthenians just as a bogatir is a hero of the demigod type as the name implies End of footnote, that the like of him can neither be imagined nor described but only told of in tales there then the lad remained for a year and at the end of the year the father came for his son he came to the self-same charred stumps in the self-same forest sat him down and said oh O immediately came out of the charred stump and said hail o man hail to thee o and what dost thou want o man asked o i have come said he for my son well come then if thou dost know him again thou shalt take him away but if thou dost not know him he shall serve with me yet another year 
so the man went with o they came to his hut and o took whole handfuls of millet and scattered it about and myriads of cocks came running up and pecked it well dost thou know thy son again said o the man stared and stared there was nothing but cocks and one cock was just like another he could not pick out his son well said o as thou dost not know him go home again this year thy son must remain in my service so the man went home again the second year passed away and the man again went to o he came to the charred stumps and said o and o popped out of the tree stump again come said he and see if thou canst recognize him now then he took him to a sheep pen and there were rows and rows of rams and one ram was just like another the man stared and stared but he could not pick out his son thou mayst as well go home then said o but thy son shall live with me yet another year so the man went away sad at heart the third year also passed away and the man came again to find o he went on and on till there met him an old man all as white as milk and the raiment of this old man was glistening white hail to thee o man said he hail to thee also my father whither doth god lead thee i am going to free my son from o how so then the man told the old white father how he had hired out his son to o and under what conditions ay ay said the old white father tis a vile pagan thou hast to deal with he will lead thee about by the nose for a long time yes said the man i perceive that he is a vile pagan but i know not what in the world to do with him canst thou not tell me then dear father how i may recover my son yes i can said the old man then prithee tell me darling father and i'll pray for thee to god all my life for though he has not been much of a son to me he is still my own flesh and blood hearken then said the old man when thou dost go to o he will let loose a multitude of doves before thee but choose not one of these doves the dove thou shalt choose must be the one that comes not out but remains sitting beneath the pear tree pruning its feathers that will be thy son then the man thanked the old white father and went on he came to the charred stumps oh cried he and out came o and led him to his sylvan realm there o scattered about handfuls of wheat and called his doves and there flew down such a multitude of them that there was no counting them and one dove was just like another dost thou recognize thy son asked o and thou knowest him again he is thine and thou knowest him not he is mine now all the doves there were pecking at the wheat all but one that sat alone beneath the pear tree sticking out its breast and pruning its feathers that is my son said the man since thou hast guessed him take him replied o then the father took the dove and immediately it changed into a handsome young man and a handsomer was not to be found in the wide world the father rejoiced greatly and embraced and kissed him let us go home my son said he so they went as they went along the road together they fell a-talking and his father asked him how he had fared at o's the son told him then the father told the son what he had suffered and it was the son's turn to listen furthermore the father said what shall we do now my son i am poor and thou art poor hast thou served these three years and earned nothing grieve not dear dad all will come right in the end look there are some young nobles hunting after a fox i will turn myself into a greyhound and catch the fox then the young nobleman will want to buy me of thee and thou must sell me to them for three hundred roubles only mind thou sell me without a chain then we shall have lots of money at home and will live happily together they went on and on and there on the borders of a forest some hounds were chasing a fox they chased it and chased it but the fox kept on escaping and the hounds could not run it down then the son changed himself into a greyhound and ran down the fox and killed it the nobleman thereupon came galloping out of the forest is that thy greyhound it is tis a good dog wilt sell it to us 
bid for it what dost thou require three hundred roubles without a chain what do we want with thy chain we would give him a chain of gold say a hundred roubles nay then take thy money and give us the dog they counted down the money and took the dog and set off hunting they sent the dog after another fox away he went after it and chased it right into the forest but then he turned into a youth again and rejoined his father they went on and on and his father said to him what use is this money to us after all it is barely enough to begin housekeeping with and repair our hut grieve not dear dad we shall get more still over yonder are some young noblemen hunting quails with falcons i will change myself into a falcon and thou must sell me to them only sell me for three hundred roubles and without a hood they went into the plain and there were some young noblemen casting their falcon at a quail the falcon pursued but always fell short of the quail and the quail always eluded the falcon the sun then changed himself into a falcon and immediately struck down its prey the young noblemen saw it and were astonished is that thy falcon tis mine sell it to us then bid for it what dost thou want for it if ye give three hundred roubles ye may take it but it must be without the hood as if we want thy hood we'll make for it a hood worthy of a tsar so they higgled and haggled but at last they gave him the three hundred roubles then the young nobles sent the falcon after another quail and it flew and flew till it beat down its prey but then he became a youth again and went on with his father how shall we manage to live with so little said the father wait a while dad and we shall have still more said the son when we pass through the fair i'll change myself into a horse and thou must sell me they will give thee a thousand roubles for me only sell me without a halter so when they got to the next little town where they were holding a fair the son changed himself into a horse a horse as supple as a serpent and so fiery that it was dangerous to approach him the father led the horse along by the halter it pranced about and struck sparks from the ground with its hoofs then the horse dealers came together and began to bargain for it a thousand roubles down said he and you may have it but without the halter what do we want with thy halter we will make for it a silver gilt halter come we'll give thee five hundred no said he then up there came a gypsy blind of one eye oh man what dost thou want for that horse said he a thousand roubles without the halter nay but that is dear little father wilt thou not take five hundred with the halter no not a bit of it take six hundred then then the gypsy began higgling and haggling but the man would not give way come sell it said he with the halter no thou gypsy i have a liking for that halter but my good man when didst thou ever see them sell a horse without a halter how then can one lead him off nevertheless the halter must remain mine look now my father i'll give thee five roubles extra only i must have the halter the old man fell a-thinking a halter of this kind is worth but three grivni footnote a grivna is the tenth part of a rouble about two and a half d end of footnote and the gypsy offers me five roubles for it let him have it so they clinched the bargain with a good drink and the old man went home with the money and the gypsy walked off with the horse but it was not really a gypsy but o oh, who had taken the shape of a gypsy then o oh rode off on the horse and the horse carried him higher than the trees of the forest but lower than the clouds of the sky at last they sank down among the woods and came to o's hut and o went into his hut and left his horse outside on the step this son of a dog shall not escape from my hands so quickly a second time said he to his wife at dawn o took the horse by the bridle and led it away to the river to water it but no sooner did the horse get to the river and bend down its head to drink 
then it turned into a perch and began swimming away o oh, without more ado turned himself into a pike and pursued the perch but just as the pike was almost up with it the perch gave a sudden twist and stuck out its spiny fins and turned its tail toward the pike so that the pike could not lay hold of it so when the pike came up to it it said perch perch turn thy head toward me i want to have a chat with thee i can hear thee very well as i am dear cousin if thou art inclined to chat said the perch so off they set again and again the pike overtook the perch 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 turn thy head round toward me i want to have a chat with thee then the perch stuck out its bristly fins again and said if thou dost wish to have a chat dear cousin i can hear thee just as well as i am so the pike kept on pursuing the perch but it was of no use at last the perch swam ashore and there was a tsarivna footnote russian tsarivna i e a tsar's daughter End of footnote. whittling an ash twig the perch changed itself into a gold ring set with garnets and the tsarivna saw it and fished up the ring out of the water full of joy she took it home and said to her father look dear papa what a nice ring i have found the tsar kissed her but the tsarivna did not know which finger it would suit best it was so lovely about the same time they told the tsar that a certain merchant had come to the palace it was o who had changed himself into a merchant the tsar went out to him and said what dost thou want old man i was sailing on the sea in my ship said o and carrying to the tsar of my own land a precious garnet ring and this ring i dropped into the water has any of thy servants perchance found this precious ring no but my daughter has said the tsar so they called the damsel and o began to beg her to give it back to him for i may not live in this world if i bring not the ring said he but it was of no avail she would not give it up then the tsar himself spoke to her nay but darling daughter give it up lest misfortune befall this man because of us give it up i say then o begged and prayed her yet more and said take what thou wilt of me only give me back the ring nay then said the tsarivna it shall be neither mine nor thine and with that she tossed the ring upon the ground and it turned into a heap of millet seed and scattered all about the floor then o oh, without more ado changed into a cock and began pecking up all the seed he pecked and pecked till he had pecked it all up yet there was one single little grain of millet which rolled right beneath the feet of the tsarivna and that he did not see when he had done pecking he got upon the window sill opened his wings and flew right away but the one remaining grain of millet seed turned into a most beauteous youth a youth so beauteous that when the tsarivna beheld him she fell in love with him on the spot and begged the tsar and tsaritsa right piteously to let her have him as her husband with no other shall i ever be happy said she my happiness is in him alone for a long time the tsar wrinkled his brows at the thought of giving his daughter to a simple youth but at last he gave them his blessing and they crowned them with bridal wreaths and all the world was bidden to the wedding feast and i too was there and drank beer and mead and what my mouth could not hold ran down over my beard and my heart rejoiced within me End of section two. Section 3 of Cossack Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cossack Fairy Tales by Robert Nisbet Bain. Section 3 The Story of the Wind. Once upon a time, there dwelt two brethren in one village, and one brother was very, very rich and the other brother was very very poor the rich man had wealth of all sorts but all that the poor man had was a heap of children one day at harvest time the poor man left his wife and went to reap and thresh out his little plot of wheat when the wind came and swept all his corn away 
down to the very last grain the poor man was exceeding wrath thereat and said come what will i'll go seek the wind and i'll tell him with what pains and trouble i had got my corn to grow and ripen and then he forsooth must needs come and blow it all away so the man went home and made ready to go and as he was making ready his wife said to him whither away husband i am going to seek the wind said he what dost thou say to that i should say do no such thing replied his wife thou knowest the saying if thou dost want to find the wind seek him on the open step he can go ten different ways to thy one think of that dear husband and go not at all i mean to go replied the man though i never return home again then he took leave of his wife and children and went straight out into the wide world to seek the wind on the open step he went on farther and farther till he saw before him a forest and on the borders of that forest stood a hut on hen's legs the man went into this hut and was filled with astonishment for there lay on the floor a huge huge old man as gray as milk he lay there stretched at full length his head on the seat of honor with an arm and leg in each of the four corners and all his hair standing on end footnote pokut the place of honor in a ruthenian peasant's hut at the right hand side of the entrance End of footnote. it was no other than the wind himself the man stared at this awful ancient with terror for never in his life had he seen anything like it god help thee old father cried he good health to thee good man said the ancient giant as he lay on the floor of the hut then he asked him in the most friendly manner whence hath god brought thee hither good man i am wandering through the wide world in search of the wind said the man if i find him i will turn back if i don't find him i shall go on and on till i do what dost thou want with the wind asked the old giant lying on the floor or what wrong hath he done thee that thou shouldst seek him out so doggedly what wrong hath he done me replied the wayfarer hearken now o ancient and i will tell thee i went straight from my wife into the field and reaped my little plot of corn but when i began to thrush it out the wind came and caught and scattered every bit of it in a twinkling so that there was not a single little grain of it left so now thou dost see old man what i have to thank him for tell me in god's name why such things be my little plot of corn was my all in all and in the sweat of my brow did i reap and thresh it but the wind came and blew it all away so that not a trace of it is to be found in the wide world then i thought to myself why should he do this and i said to my wife i'll go seek the wind and say to him another time visit not the poor man who hath but a little corn and blow it not away for bitterly doth he rue it good my son said the giant who lay on the floor i will know better in the future in future i will not blow away the poor man's corn but good man there is no need for thee to seek the wind in the open step for i myself am the wind then if thou art the wind said the man give me back my corn nay said the giant thou canst not make the dead come back from the grave yet inasmuch as i have done thee a mischief i will now give thee this sack good man and do thou take it home with thee and whenever thou wantest a meal say sack sack give me to eat and drink and immediately thou shalt have thy fill both of meat and drink so now thou wilt have wherewithal to comfort thy wife and children then the man was full of gratitude i thank thee o wind said he for thy courtesy in giving me such a sack 
as will give me my fill of meat and drink without the trouble of working for it for a lazy loon twere a double boon said the wind go home then but look now enter no tavern by the way i shall know it if thou dost no said the man i will not and then he took leave of the wind and went his way he had not gone very far when he passed by a tavern and he felt a burning desire to find out whether the wind had spoken the truth in the matter of the sack how can a man pass a tavern without going into it thought he i'll go in come what may the wind won't know because he can't see so he went into the tavern and hung up his sack upon a peg the jew who kept the tavern immediately said to him what dost thou want good man what is that to thee thou dog said the man you are all alike sneered the jew take what you can and pay for nothing dost think i want to buy anything from thee shrieked the man then turning angrily to the sack he cried sack sack give me to eat and drink immediately the table was covered with all sorts of meats and liquors then all the jews in the tavern crowded round full of amazement and asked all manner of questions why what is this good man said they never have we seen anything like this before ask no questions ye accursed jews cried the man but sit down to eat for there is enough for all so the jews and the jewesses set to and ate until they were full up to the ears and they drank the man's health in pitchers of wine of every sort and said drink good man and spare not and when thou hast drunk thy fill thou shalt lodge with us this night we'll make ready a bed for thee none shall vex thee come now eat and drink whatever thy soul desires so the jews flattered him with devilish cunning and almost forced the wine-jars to his lips the simple fellow did not perceive their malice and cunning and he got so drunk that he could not move from the place but went to sleep where he was then the jews changed his sack for another which they hung up on a peg and then they woke him dust here fellow cried they get up it is time to go home dost thou not see the morning light the man sat up and scratched the back of his head for he was loath to go but what was he to do so he shouldered the sack that was hanging on the peg and went off home when he got to his house he cried open the door wife then his wife opened the door and he went in and hung his sack on the peg and said sit down at the table dear wife and you children sit down there too now thank god we shall have enough to eat and drink and to spare the wife looked at her husband and smiled she thought he was mad but down she sat and her children sat down all round her and she waited to see what her husband would do next then the man said sack sack give to us meat and drink but the sack was silent then he said again sack sack give my children something to eat and still the sack was silent then the man fell into a violent rage thou didst give me something at the tavern cried he and now i may call in vain thou givest nothing and thou hearest nothing and leaping from his seat he took up a club and began beating the sack till he had knocked a hole in the wall and beaten the sack to bits then he set off to seek the wind again but his wife stayed at home and put everything to rights again railing and scolding at her husband as a madman but the man went to the wind and said hail to thee o wind good health to thee o man replied the wind then the wind asked wherefore hast thou come hither o man did i not give thee a sack what more dost thou want a pretty sack indeed replied the man that sack of thine has been the cause of much mischief to me and mine what mischief has it done thee why look now old father i'll tell thee what it has done it wouldn't give me anything to eat and drink so i began beating it and beat the wall in 
now what shall i do to repair my crazy hut give me something old father but the wind replied nay o oh man thou must do without fools are neither sown nor reaped but grow of their own accord hast thou not been into a tavern i have not said the man thou hast not why wilt thou lie well and suppose i did lie said the man if thou suffer harm through thine own fault hold thy tongue about it that's what i say yet it is all the fault of thy sack that this evil has come upon me if it had only given me to eat and to drink i should not have come to thee again at this the wind scratched his head a bit but then he said well then thou man there's a little ram for thee and whenever thou dost want money say to it little ram little ram scatter money and it will scatter money as much as thou wilt only bear this in mind go not into a tavern for if thou dost i will know all about it and if thou comest to me a third time thou shalt have cause to remember it for ever good said the man i won't go then he took the little ram thanked the wind and went on his way so the man went along leading the little ram by a string and they came to a tavern that very same tavern where he had been before and again a strong desire came upon the man to go in so he stood by the door and began thinking whether he should go in or not and whether he had any need to find out the truth about the little ram well well he said at last i'll go in only this time i won't get drunk i'll drink just a glass or so and then i'll go home so into the tavern he went dragging the little ram after him for he was afraid to let it go now when the jews who were inside there saw the little ram they began shrieking and said what art thou thinking of o man that thou bringest that little ram into the room are there no barns outside where thou mayest put it up hold your tongues ye accursed wretches replied the man what has it got to do with you it is not the sort of ram that fellows like you deal in and if you don't believe me spread a cloth on the floor and you shall see something i warrant you then he said little ram little ram scatter money and the little ram scattered so much money that it seemed to grow and the jews screeched like demons oh man man cried they such a ram as that we have never seen in all our days sell it to us we will give thee such a lot of money for it you may pick up all that money ye accursed ones cried the man but i don't mean to sell my ram then the jews picked up the money but they laid before him a table covered with all the dishes that a man's heart may desire and they begged him to sit down and make merry and said with true jewish cunning though thou mayest get a little lively don't get drunk for thou knowest how drink plays the fool with a man's wits the man marvelled at the straightforwardness of the jews in warning him against the drink and forgetting everything else sat down at table and began drinking pot after pot of mead and talking with the jews and his little ram went clean out of his head but the jews made him drunk and laid him in the bed and changed rams with him his they took away and put in its place one of their own exactly like it when the man had slept off his carouse he arose and went away taking the ram with him after bidding the jews farewell when he got to his hut he found his wife in the doorway and the moment she saw him coming she went into the hut and cried to her children come children make haste make haste for daddy is coming and brings a little ram along with him get up and look sharp about it an evil year of waiting has been the lot of wretched me but he has come home at last the husband arrived at the door and said open the door little wife open i say the wife replied thou art not a great nobleman so open the door thyself why dost thou get so drunk that thou dost not know how to open a door 
It's an evil time that I spend with thee. Here we are with all these little children, and yet thou dost go away and drink. Then the wife opened the door, and the husband walked into the hut and said, Good health to thee, dear wife. But the wife cried, Why dost thou bring that ram inside the hut? Can't it stay outside the walls? Wife, wife, said the man, speak, but don't screech. Now we shall have all manner of good things, and the children will have a fine time of it. What, said the wife, what good can we get from that wretched ram? Where shall we get the money to find food for it? Why, we've nothing to eat ourselves, and thou dost saddle us with a ram besides. Stuff and nonsense, I say. Silence, wife, replied the husband. That ram is not like other rams, I tell thee. What sort is it, then? asked his wife. Don't ask questions, but spread a cloth on the floor, and keep thine eyes open. Why spread a cloth? asked the wife. Why? shrieked the man in a rage. Do what I tell thee, and hold thy tongue. But the wife said, Alas, alas, I have an evil time of it. Thou dost nothing at all but go away and drink, and then thou comest home, and dost talk nonsense, and bringest sacks and rams with thee, and knockest down our little hut. At this the husband could control his rage no longer, but shrieked at the ram, Little ram, little ram, scatter money. But the ram only stood there and stared at him. Then he cried again, Little ram, little ram, scatter money. But the ram stood there stock still and did nothing. Then the man in his anger caught up a piece of wood and struck the ram on the head. But the poor ram only uttered a feeble baa and fell to the earth dead. The man was now very much offended and said, I'll go to the wind again and I'll tell him what a fool he has made of me. Then he took up his hat and went, leaving everything behind him, and the poor wife put everything to rights and reproached and railed at her husband. So the man came to the wind for the third time and said, Wilt thou tell me, please, if thou art really the wind or no? What's the matter with thee? asked the wind. I'll tell thee what's the matter, said the man. Why hast thou laughed at and mocked me and made such a fool of me? I laugh at thee, thundered the old father as he lay there on the floor and turned round on the other ear. Why didst thou not hold fast what I gave thee? Why didst thou not listen to me when I told thee not to go into the tavern, eh? "'What tavern dost thou mean?' asked the man proudly. "'As for the sack and the ram thou didst give me, they only did me a mischief. Give me something else.' "'What's the use of giving thee anything?' said the wind. "'Thou wilt only take it to the tavern.' "'Out of the drum, my twelve henchmen,' cried the wind. "'And just give this accursed drunkard a good lesson, that he may keep his throat dry and listen a little more to old people. Immediately twelve henchmen leaped out of his drum and began giving the man a sound thrashing. Then the man saw that it was no joke and begged for mercy. "'Dear old father wind,' cried he, "'be merciful, and let me get off alive. I'll not come to thee again, though I should have to wait till the judgment day, and I'll do all thy behests.' Into the drum, my henchman, cried the wind. And now, O oh man, said the wind, thou mayest have this drum with the twelve henchmen, and go to those accursed Jews, and if they will not give thee back thy sack and thy ram, thou wilt know what to say. So the man thanked the wind for his good advice and went on his way. He came to the inn, and when the Jews saw that he brought nothing with him, they said, Hearken, O oh man, don't come here, for we have no brandy. What do I want with your brandy? cried the man in a rage. Then for what hast thou come hither? I have come for my own. Thy own, said the Jews. What dost thou mean? What do I mean? roared the man. Why, my sack and my ram, which you must give up to me. What ram? What sack? said the Jews. 
why thou didst take them away from here thyself yes but you changed them said the man what dost thou mean by changed whined the jews we will go before the magistrate and thou shalt hear from us about this you will have an evil time of it if you go before the magistrate said the man but at any rate give me back my own and he sat down upon a bench then the jews caught him by the shoulders to cast him out and cried be off thou rascal does any one know where this man comes from no doubt he is an evildoer the man could not stand this so he cried out of the drum my henchman and give the accursed jews a sound drubbing that they may know better than to take in honest folk and immediately the twelve henchmen leaped out of the drum and began thwacking the jews finely oh oh roared the jews oh dear darling good man we'll give thee whatever thou dost want only leave off beating us let us live a bit longer in the world and we will give thee back everything good said the man and another time you'll know better than to deceive people then he cried into the drum my henchman and the henchman disappeared leaving the jews more dead than alive then they gave the man his sack and his ram and he went home but it was a long long time before the jews forgot those henchmen so the man went home and his wife and children saw him coming from afar daddy is coming home now with a sack and a ram said she what shall we do we shall have a bad time of it we shall have nothing left at all god defend us poor wretches go and hide everything children so the children hastened away but the husband came to the door and said open the door open the door thyself replied the wife again the husband bade her open the door but she paid no heed to him the man was astonished this was carrying a joke too far so he cried to his henchman 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 out of the drum and teach my wife to respect her husband then the henchman leaped out of the drum laid the good wife by the heels and began to give her a sound drubbing oh my dear darling husband shrieked the wife never to the end of my days will i be sulky with thee again i'll do whatever thou tellest me only leave off beating me then i have taught thee sense eh said the man oh yes yes good husband cried she then the man said henchman henchman into the drum and the henchman leaped into it again leaving the poor wife more dead than alive then the husband said to her wife spread a cloth upon the floor the wife scudded about as nimbly as a fly and spread a cloth out on the floor without a word then the husband said little ram little ram scatter money and the little ram scattered money till there were piles and piles of it pick it up my children said the man and thou too wife take what thou wilt and they didn't wait to be asked twice then the man hung up his sack on a peg and said sack sack meat and drink then he caught hold of it and shook it and immediately the table was as full as it could hold with all manner of victuals and drink sit down my children and thou too dear wife and eat thy fill thank god we shall now have no lack of food and shall not have to work for it either so the man and his wife were very happy together and were never tired of thanking the wind they had not had the sack and the ram very long when they grew very rich and then the husband said to his wife i tell thee what wife what said she let us invite my brother to come and see us very good she replied invite him but dost thou think he'll come why shouldn't he asked her husband now thank god we have everything we want he wouldn't come to us when we were poor and he was rich because then he was ashamed to say that i was his brother but now even he hasn't got so much as we have so they made ready and the man went to invite his brother the poor man came to his rich brother and said hail to thee brother god help thee now the rich brother was threshing wheat on his threshing floor and raising his head was surprised to see his brother there and said to him haughtily i thank thee 
hail to thee also. Sit down, my brother, and tell us why thou hast come hither. Thanks, my brother, I do not want to sit down. I have come hither to invite thee to us, thee and thy wife. Wherefore? asked the rich brother. The poor man said, My wife prays thee, and I pray thee also, to come and dine with us of thy courtesy. Good, replied the rich brother, smiling secretly. I will come, whatever thy dinner may be. So the rich man went with his wife to the poor man, and already from afar they perceived that the poor man had grown rich, and the poor man rejoiced greatly when he saw his rich brother in his house, and his tongue was loosened, and he began to show him everything whatsoever he possessed. The rich man was amazed that things were going so well with his brother, and asked him how he had managed to get on so. But the poor man answered, Don't ask me, brother, I have more to show thee yet. Then he took him to his copper money, and said, There are my oats, brother. Then he took and showed him his silver money, and said, That's the sort of barley I thresh on my threshing floor. And, last of all, he took him to his gold money, and said, There, my dear brother, is the best wheat I've got. Then the rich brother shook his head, not once nor twice, and marveled at the sight of so many good things, and he said, wherever didst thou pick up all this my brother oh i've more than that to show thee yet just be so good as to sit down on that chair and i'll show and tell thee everything then they sat them down and the poor man hung up his sack upon a peg sack sack meat and drink he cried and immediately the table was covered with all manner of dishes so they ate and ate till they were full up to the ears when they had eaten and drunken their fill, the poor man called to his son to bring the little ram into the hut. So the lad brought in the ram, and the rich brother wondered what they were going to do with it. Then the poor man said, Little ram, scatter money, and the little ram scattered money, till there were piles and piles of it on the floor. Pick it up, said the poor man to the rich man and his wife. So they picked it up and the rich brother and his wife marveled, and the brother said, Thou hast a very nice piece of goods there, brother. If I had only something like that, I should lack nothing. Then, after thinking a long time, he said, Sell it to me, my brother. No, said the poor man, I will not sell it. After a little time, however, the rich brother said again, Come now, I'll give thee for it six yoke of oxen, and a plough, and a harrow, and a hay-fork, and I'll give thee besides lots of corn to sow. Thus thou wilt have plenty, but give me the ram and the sack. So at last they exchanged. The rich man took the sack and the ram, and the poor man took the oxen, and went out to the plough. Then the poor brother went out ploughing all day, but he neither watered his oxen nor gave them anything to eat, and next day the poor brother again went out to his oxen, but found them rolling on their sides on the ground. He began to pull and tug at them, but they didn't get up. Then he began to beat them with a stick, but they uttered not a sound. The man was surprised to find them fit for nothing, and off he ran to his brother, not forgetting to take with him his drum with the henchmen. When the poor brother came to the rich brothers, he lost no time in crossing his threshold, and said, "'Hail, my brother!' good health to thee also replied the rich man why hast thou come hither has thy plough broken or thy oxen failed thee perchance thou hast watered them with foul water so that their blood is stagnant and their flesh inflamed the moraine take em if i know thy meaning cried the poor brother all that i know is that i thwacked them till my arms ached and they wouldn't stir and not a single grunt did they give, till I was so angry that I spat at them and came to tell thee. Give me back my sack and my ram, I say, and take back thy oxen, for they won't listen to me. What? Take them back? roared the rich brother. Dost think I only made the exchange for a single day? No, I gave them to thee once and for all, and now thou wouldst rip the whole thing up like a goat at the fair. 
i have no doubt thou hast neither watered them nor fed them and that is why they won't stand up i didn't know said the poor man that oxen needed water and food didn't know screeched the rich man in a mighty rage and taking the poor brother by the hand he led him away from the hut go away said he and never come here again or i'll have thee hanged on a gallows ah what a big gentleman we are said the poor brother just thou give me back my own and then i will go away thou hadst better not stop here said the rich brother come stir thy stumps thou pagan go home ere i beat thee don't say that replied the poor man but give me back my ram and my sack and then i will go at this the rich brother quite lost his temper and cried to his wife and children why do you stand staring like that can't you come and help me to pitch this insolent rogue out of the house this however was something beyond a joke so the poor brother called to his henchman 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 out of the drum and give this brother of mine and his wife a sound drubbing that they may think twice about it another time before they pitch a poor brother out of their hut then the henchmen leaped out of the drum and laid hold of the rich brother and his wife and trounced them soundly until the rich brother yelled with all his might oh oh my own true brother take what thou wilt only let me off alive whereupon the poor brother cried to his henchmen 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 into the drum and the henchmen disappeared immediately then the poor brother took his ram and his sack and set off home with them and they lived happily ever after and grew richer and richer they sowed neither wheat nor barley and yet they had lots and lots to eat and i was there and drank mead and beer what my mouth couldn't hold ran down my beard for you there's a koska but there be fat hearth cakes for me the asker and if i have aught to eat thou shalt share the treat end of section three section four of cossack fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by kurt from tucson arizona cossack fairy tales by robert nisbet bain the voices at the window a nobleman went hunting one autumn and with him went a goodly train of huntsmen all day long they hunted and hunted and at the end of the day they had caught nothing at last dark night overtook them it had now grown bitterly cold and the rain began to fall heavily the nobleman was wet to the skin and his teeth chattered he rubbed his hands together and cried oh had we but a warm hut and a white bed and soft bread and sour kvass footnote a sourish drink and footnote we should have naught to complain of but would tell tales and feign fables till dawn of day immediately there shone a light in the depths of the forest they hastened up to it and lo there was a hut they entered and on the table lay bread and a jug of kvass and the hut was warm and the bed therein was white everything just as the nobleman had desired it so they all entered after him and said grace and had supper and laid them down to sleep they all slept all but one but to him slumber would not come about midnight he heard a strange noise and something came to the window and said o oh, thou son of a dog thou didst say if we had but a warm hut and a white bed and soft bread and sour kvass we should have naught to complain of but would tell tales and feign fables till dawn but now thou hast forgotten thy fine promise wherefore this shall befall thee on the way home thou shalt fall in with an apple tree full of apples and thou shalt desire to taste of them and when thou hast tasted thereof thou shalt burst and if any of these thy huntsmen hear this thing and tell thee of it that man shall become stone to the knee 
all this that huntsman heard and he thought woe is me and about the second cock crow something else came to the window and said o oh, thou son of a dog thou didst say if we had but a warm hut and a white bed and soft bread and sour kvass we should have naught to complain of but would tell tales and feign fables till dawn but now thou hast forgotten thy fine promises wherefore this shall befall thee on thy way home thou shalt come upon a spring by the roadside a spring of pure water and thou shalt desire to drink of it and when thou hast drunk thereof thou shalt burst but if any of these thy huntsmen hear and tell thee of this thing he shall become stone to the girdle all this that huntsman heard and he thought to himself woe is me again toward the third cock crow he heard something else coming to the window and it said o oh, thou son of a dog thou didst say if only we had a warm hut and a white bed and soft bread and sour kvass we should have naught to complain of but would tell tales and feign fables till dawn but now thou hast forgotten all thy fine promises wherefore this shall befall thee on thy way home thou shalt come upon a feather bed in the highway a longing for rest shall come over thee and thou wilt lie down on it and the moment thou liest down thereon thou shalt burst but if any of thy huntsmen hear this thing and tell it thee he shall become stone up to the neck all this that huntsman heard and then he awoke his comrades and said it is time to depart let us go then said the nobleman so on they went and they had not gone very far when they saw an apple tree growing by the wayside and on it were apples so beautiful that words cannot describe them the nobleman felt that he must taste of these apples or die but the wakeful huntsman rushed up and cut down the apple tree whereupon apples and apple tree turned to ashes but the huntsman galloped on before and hid himself they went on a little farther till they came to a spring and the water of that spring was so pure and clear that words cannot describe it then the nobleman felt that he must drink of that water or die but the huntsman rushed up and splashed in the spring with his sword and immediately the water turned to blood the nobleman was wrath and cried cut me down that son of a dog but the huntsman rode on in front and hid himself they went on still farther till they came upon a golden bed in the highway full of white feathers so soft and cosy that words cannot describe it the nobleman felt that he must rest in that bed or die then the huntsman rushed up and struck the bed with his sword and it turned to coal but the nobleman was very wrath and cried shoot me down that son of a dog but the huntsman rode on before and hid himself when they got home the nobleman commanded them to bring the huntsman before him what hast thou done thou son of satan he cried i must needs slay thee but the huntsman said my master bid them bring hither into the courtyard an old mare fit for naught but the knacker they brought the mare and he mounted it and said my master last midnight something came beneath the window and said o son of a dog thou saidst if only we had a warm hut and a white bed and soft bread and sour kvass we should grieve no more but tell tales and feign fables till dawn and now thou hast forgotten thy promise wherefore this shall befall thee on thy way home thou shalt come upon an apple tree covered with apples by the wayside and straightway thou shalt long to eat of them and the moment thou tastest thereof thou shalt burst and if any of thy huntsmen hears this thing and tells thee of it he shall become stone up to the knee when the huntsman had spoken so far the horse on which he sat became stone up to the knee then he went on about the second cockcrow something else came to the window and said the selfsame thing and prophesied he shall come upon a spring by the roadside a spring of pure water and he shall long to drink thereof and the moment he tastes of it he shall burst and whoever hears and tells him of this thing shall become stone right up to the girdle and when the huntsman had spoken so far the horse on which he sat became stone right up to the breast and he continued and said 
about the third cockcrow something else came to the window and said the selfsame thing and added this shall befall thy lord on his way home he shall come upon a white bed on the road and he shall desire to rest upon it and the moment he rests upon it he shall burst and whoever hears and tells him of this thing shall become stone right up to the neck and with these words he leaped from the horse and the horse became stone right up to its neck that therefore my master was why i did what i did and i pray thee to pardon me end of section four